Hi, my name is Brian, and most of you probably know me as the guy who's overly obsessed about shortcuts and macros and touchscreens, or maybe as that guy who got Alexa to control his Cubase session. But in reality, I'm a full-time composer and producer, and I don't just sit around making macros all day. Quite the opposite. I make my macros so I don't have to interact with my computer. I want to get a thought onto my Cubase session as quickly as possible. And here I am talking about macros again. Okay, no, this video is not about keyboard shortcuts. In this video, I'm giving you a tour of my studio. Why am I doing a studio tour? Two reasons. One, if there's anything musicians love more than making music is obsessing about gear. So consider this video a therapeutic courtesy. Two, I'm actually about to move to a new studio, and this humble studio has served me tremendously for the past two and a half years, and I wanted to have a snapshot of this studio to remind myself how things used to be, and maybe to give you a point of reference as I'm documenting the transition into the new studio. And also, I know that a lot of you are now taking your gear out of big studios and bringing it into your home, and maybe you'll get some ideas for your own home studio, because this studio is tiny. And with that, we started our tour. So my studio is a spare bedroom in a two bedroom condo. Um, it's a relatively small room. It's 10.8 by 8.6 feet. So yeah, not a lot of room. Uh, as far as sound treatment and soundproofing, I'm renting this place. So my options are super limited. So I went with freestanding bass traps and acoustic panels from GIK Acoustics. They do the job, they look fantastic in Instagram posts, and I don't have to drill holes into a rented apartment's walls. For the ceiling, I have nothing because, again, renting this place and it's concrete ceiling, so I'm not touching that. And then as far as soundproofing, again, I got kind of lucky because this is a fairly new building and I guess they did really good soundproofing between units because I can't hear any of my neighbors and I assume they can't hear mine. I don't work in loud volumes anyways because I work for a lot of hours and I want to keep these safe for a lot of time. But I have worked at 1, 2 a.m. And yeah, I got zero complaints. So again, got super lucky. So that kind of covers the basics of the room. Let's start digging into the gear. But before I go any further, let me just say that as of recording this video, I have around 400 subscribers, so I don't have any sponsors and nobody's paying me to say anything. I bought all of this gear with my own money. So yeah, nothing sponsored. All of this is my own personal opinions. Okay, let's go. So if you follow me on Instagram, which if you don't, please do, you probably already know that my main computer is the 2019 Mac Pro. I opted for the 28 core version because I'm a fancy bitch and I could afford it. Uh, looking back at it now, I probably should have opted for the 18 core because sometimes I lower my thread count in software and I get better results with the 18 core. But you live and you learn. For RAM, I actually went with third-party RAM off of Amazon because one can be an Apple fanboy, but that does not mean I'm stupid. Nobody should pay so much money for RAM. So yeah, got it off of Amazon for a lot less than what Apple is selling and it works great. I did upgrade for one terabyte of internal storage just because I needed a little bit more and you can only get it from Apple. For project and samples, I have two and a half inch SSDs connected to the Blackmagic's multi-dock. It works great. I think coming up on one year with this thing, it disconnected without telling me anything twice. So it's not perfect, but I mean, it's, it's fine, I guess. For USB hubs, I have two 7-port USB hubs from Pluggable, and unlike other USB hubs, they all work, all 7 ports, and I have all 7 populated in both of them. Even hard drives don't disconnect, so if you're looking for a really good reliable USB hub, go with Pluggable, not sponsored, just sharing the love. They're a little bit more expensive than the other ones, but um, it's definitely worth it. Okay, let's check out the desk. So the desk itself is platformed by output. It's relatively cheap for everything that it's offering. It's super sturdy. It houses up to an 88 key keyboard. It has three 3U rack spaces and a built-in cable management. Oh, and it looks really good on Instagram posts. So what more do you want? A desk by Monkwood. I know, maybe for my next, next, next birthday. 
I'm rocking a triple monitor setup, two for Cubase, one for video. They're all connected to a vase mount, so I don't have any of the stands. They sit flush with the desk itself, so it's right in my line of sight. The vase mount wasn't really expensive. I'll have links in the description below. Right, let's start unraveling this busy desk. Um, starting with the rack units from left to right. So on my left, I have the Kemper profiling amp. I know everybody has their own opinion about which amp simulator is the best, and you should probably record a real amp if you can, but I actually like the way that it sounds. The workflow with having just presets and profiles is really comfortable to me. I actually like the new editor, and if I need anything more than that, then I'll go to a proper studio and record a real amp. But so far, I think having this for five years, I got zero complaints from clients regarding my guitar sound, so I deemed this Kemper worthy. In the center rack, I have my audio interface, and actually, this has changed not long ago. So this is actually the second time that I'm shooting this video because the first time was eh, and then also um, some gear has changed. So two weeks ago, I was rocking the RME Fireface UFX and it's a fantastic audio interface. It just died on me. And so I just decided to jump on the hype train for the Universal Audio Apollos and I got the Apollo X8 and the converters are just fantastic. And then I kind of started getting into the plugin and the plugins sound just really good. So yeah, now I'm rocking the UAD Apollo and below that I have the Ferrofish A16 Mark II. If you're not familiar with the Ferrofish, it's basically an ADAT interface that takes the ADAT ports at the back of the Apollo and converts them into 16 audio in and 16 analog audio outs. With the Apollo, I actually only get eight in and eight out, even though I'm using two sets of ADAT ports, which is kind of weird, but it is what it is, but still it allows me to connect eight more analog gear um, to my setup. And then on the right rack, I have the Korg Pitch Black Tuner, which is directly connected to the Kemper. So it's always receiving a dry signal from the Kemper before the amp and everything. So I can tune my guitar whenever I want. I don't have to go into tuner mode in my Kemper or disconnect my guitar and then plug it into the tuner. It just works and it's always there, super clear, super comfortable. And then below that, I have the Chandler Red 47 preamp, which I'm actually talking into through my Neumann condenser microphone. And I just love this preamp. It takes everything that you throw at it and makes it sound so much better that it kind of sounds like you're plugged in with a completely different microphone. And then it also has a killer DI that distorts like a champ. And if you're plugged in with a guitar or a bass or a synth, you can and should crank the gain up all the way up because it distorts like crazy but then retains the original character of the sound this one is definitely a keeper okay and then on my desktop from left to right starting with the not audio related i have an anchor wireless charger the angle and the position that it's at is kind of perfect because it's almost out of my line of sight so i don't see it when i'm actually focusing on work but then if i get a notification i can just glance at my phone see what it is and go back to work and then my phone is always charged up which is super nice. For MIDI CC faders, I'm using the Palette Gear. Even though it's a little finicky with USB hubs and it kind of wants its own port, once you get it working, it's actually a really smooth fader action and a really good fader size. I actually backed them up on their Kickstarter for version two of this product and I'm about to receive it fairly soon. So drop a like if you want me to make a review and compare the two versions. Okay, let's get it out of the way. I'm a lefty. So this is why I have my mouse and my trackpad on the left side of the desk. Why both a mouse and a trackpad? Well, a mouse for when I'm sitting down and then the trackpad when I'm standing up so I don't have to bend my wrist gripping the mouse. And also there's a software called Audio Swift that converts your trackpad into MIDI CC faders and pitch band controller if you want to. So I want to try using that and then kind of get rid of the, um, the touche. Above my mouse, I have the Stream Deck. This used to be my main Stream Deck, and then I got addicted, and then I got the bigger brother, the Stream Deck XL. And now this kind of houses my secondary functions. So um, in Cubase, launching visibility settings or launching different email accounts, the things that I don't do all the time. A notable mention that I want to point out is my wrist rest. It's by Glorious Gaming. You don't have to get this one specifically, even though this is the best one that I had so far. Before that, I had one from Amazon or from Staples or whatever, but don't neglect the wrist rest. You are using your mouse all day and this makes 
a really big change on your life quality. Don't neglect your hands, you need them. Smack in the middle of the desk, I have the Avid S1, and I've been using Avid controllers for a while now. I actually don't want to go into details about the Avid S1 right now because I'm making a separate video about it, but I will say this is probably one of my most used pieces of gear in my studio, and I can recommend this guy enough. Right above the S1, I have my iPad, which if you're watching this video and you're familiar with this channel, you know exactly what I'm using this for. It is the first generation 12.9 inch iPad Pro. The keyboard is nothing special, it's just the one that came with the Mac Pro. I will point out, however, that I have two sets of Magic Mouses, Magic Mice, Magic Mouse, um, and two sets of the Magic Keyboard with the numpad. Specifically the one with the numpad, because I get more keys, and especially with Cubase and DAWs, it's better to have more keys for keyboard shortcuts. But the reason that I have two sets of each is that once I use one, I can recharge the other one, and then I don't have to remember to charge it, just whenever it tells me that it's running out of battery, I just disconnect it, plug it in, get the other one, and I'm ready to go. On the right hand side of the desk, I have most of my controllers because I'm using my left hand for my mouse um, and then I'm controlling things with my right hand. And so let's do a quick round and just unravel whatever is going on on the right hand side of the desk. So first of all, Profit 12, 90% analog, sounds like a dream, probably my most used synth in the studio, never selling this one. JL Cooper MCS6. Ever since I got addicted to zooming in and out with a jog dial on the Avid Artist Control, I was looking for something similar when I moved to the Avid Artist Mix and now the S1. And so this guy is pretty expensive. I got it off of eBay for a reasonably good price, but it's still pretty expensive for what it is. However, everything plus the jog dial is customizable. So I can now zoom in and out using the jog dial and every button is customizable. And I actually use every button on this in my QA setup. However, it could use some vinyl label stickers to label all of the buttons and what they do, but I mean, for now, it works. Stream Deck XL. Do I, do I really need to explain? The Shuttle Express is actually a new addition to the studio. So before I had that, I had the RME Arc Remote connected to the Fireface UFX. And that would control my volume and my mutes and everything. And I really got used to controlling my volume through the Arc Remote. And the Arc Remote dial was stepped, so you can actually feel each of the step as you were playing with a volume dial. And so I was looking for another jog dial that was stepped, and the Shuttle Express is exactly that. It's more limited because it's not directly integrated with the Apollo, but it's fully customizable, and then I can show my mixer and hide it and mute and then control my volume, and um, my workflow kind of doesn't really change from one audio interface to the other. Finally, we have knob control. This was a Kickstarter project, but now it's a real boy and a real product that you can outright buy from the website if they have it in stock. It's a really nice touch sensitive knob that basically whatever you hover your mouse over, once you grab the knob and start turning, it will actually click and drag on that parameter up and down or left and right, depending on which mode you're on. It also has some cool little features like undo and redo, and it can actually drag diagonally or in circles if you're into that kind of stuff. And you can also have window and mouse recall, so you can have certain parameters tied to the knob itself, which is pretty nice. I probably use it once or twice a week, but your mileage may vary. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. It works really well. And then finishing up the desk, my keyboard is the Studio Logic SL88 Grand. It is the best piano-like feeling MIDI controller in its price range that would fit the platform desk, since the pitch band is not on the side, but on the top. If you want to have something that feels more authentic than that, you need to get a Roland or a Nord Stage, and that bumps up the price quite significantly. My monitors are the Neumann KH310s. It took me a while to get to those. I started off with the Samsung Resolves when I just started making music on my computer, and then when I started getting gigs, I jumped up to the Atom A7s. After that, I had the PMC22 series, and then I got 
the Neumanns. I find them to be the perfect balance between liveliness and accuracy. Some other monitors out there could be so surgical that it's really hard to be inspired by. I'm not trying to bash any other monitor company, it's just a personal preference. And eventually I might move to something else because as workflow change, preference changes, but right now, these are kind of perfect for me. For microphones, I don't have a big collection because I kind of designed this studio to be more of a production studio than a recording studio. And I usually work in the box and I don't have a lot of clients coming in, especially now with everything that's going on, I pretty much work alone. And so I don't record a lot of things. When I'm recording electric guitars, it's just directly into the camper. And if I do have to record something like my acoustic guitar or my flutes or my ukulele, I would do it with the Neumann KM184, which pairs really really great with the Chandler Red 47. This is actually what you're hearing right now as I'm recording this video. This is what I use to record my videos. And then for vocals, I do have the Warm Audio W847, which sounds really good. I don't know if it sounds like a Neumann U47, because I never had one or recorded through one, but I just like the way that it sounds on my vocals when I'm doing guides and backing vocals. I do have the Mojave MA200, which is a fantastic microphone, and on some singers, it just sounds fantastic fantastic, but I am in the transition of replacing both of them for something else because I find that having two tube mics into the Chandler is just a little much too warmthness. And so I'm kind of eyeing the Townsend Lab Sphere microphone just because it comes with the microphone modeling with the UAD and I can kind of monitor myself through every microphone out there. So yeah, this is probably going to be the next transition. and. As I'm doing that, I'll probably make videos about that. So these are pretty much the three microphones that I own. I do, however, have a Shure SM57, and it was sitting in my drawer forever, not being used, and then one day I had to record a vocal guide, and I was too lazy to hook up my tube microphone and let the tube do its thing until it's ready. So I just grabbed the Shure SM57 through the Chandler. Sounded fantastic. I needed to do some work afterwards, but the result was fantastic. So if you're on a budget, don't skip on the 57. It really sounds good. And then as you can see, my uh, microphone stand is always at arm's reach, so I can just grab it and get the microphone close to me, record my guitar, record my ideas, push it back, keep on working. And then my guitars are always on the left side. And unfortunately, this room is too small to have a guitar stand rack, and so I opted for a double guitar stand by Cooper Stand. You probably don't know them, but they're really good, really sturdy, look really nice, not industrial like other guitar stands. And then I can have one acoustic, one electric, or two electrics if I want to get different flavors. But since they're one behind the other and not kind of stacked like a regular guitar rack, it saves a lot of space in small spaces like this. And as long as we're talking guitars, might as well cover the guitar collection. My favorite guitar is my Fender Custom Shop 62 Jazzmaster. This is probably the guitar that I would grab out of a burning building. I bought it off of Sweetwater's website without even hearing it. I just really like the way that it looked. Um, obviously, it's not vintage. It's probably from 2012, but I was super lucky because this is probably the best sounding jazz master I've ever played. And I love jazz masters. And so, yeah, I haven't changed anything about it. Just changed the bridge to a mastery bridge because it came with the old style um, jazz master bridge, which didn't hold tuning very well. It didn't sustain as well. But other than that, it's exactly how it came from the factory and my favorite guitar in the world. Staying with the Jazzmaster collection, which is basically just this one and the other one, this is the Fender Select Jazzmaster. This is a limited run that they had back in 2012. And when I saw it, I just knew that I had to have it, but unfortunately, I didn't have enough money at the time to buy it, so I kind of missed on that run. But years later, my wife 
got one for my birthday, and we were super lucky to find a store that just had a display model that they never sold, so I'm technically the first owner of this guitar, which is super cool. I didn't love the pickups that came with it, so I switched them to Coil's Boutique pickups. You probably never heard of Coil's Boutique before, but I love their pickups. They're all hand-wound, and I have them on all of my guitars except from my custom shop, Jazzmaster. I'm actually good friends with the owner, but they are not paying me anything to say this. They actually don't know that I'm making this video. I'm just a really big fan of their work, and if you're interested, I'll have a link to their store in the description. So as I mentioned before, this room is really small, so I don't have room for all of my guitars. So right outside my door, I have the GNL Legacy. This guitar I bought when I just moved to Canada and all of the rest of my guitars were on their way here in containers and I just needed something to start working. It sounds like a Strat, it plays like a Strat, it's relatively cheap and it's a really good replica. Um, of a Stratocaster. However, I did upgrade the pickups to Coil's Boutique just to give it a really big upgrade because after I upgraded the pickups, it sounded fantastic. Eventually, I might upgrade to a real Strat. I don't play it too much just because I really like the Jazzmaster sound, but it's a personal thing. It's nothing bad to say about this guitar. Really like this one. Last but definitely not least in my electric guitar collection is a one-of-a-kind hand-built guitar by the owner of Coils Boutique. So a little over a year ago, the owner of Coils told me that they started making one-off instruments. And me knowing the hands at work, I just knew that I had to have one. So we discussed back and forth, sharing ideas, and eventually came up with this beauty. So this is Mika. This is both her name and her model. It is a solid one-piece Karina body and neck, so no neck joint or anything like that, which how good does this look? It also features a walnut fretboard and it has a P90 and a humbucker pickup, all from Coles Boutique, obviously. It is effortless to play and is, it is surprisingly light and it sustains forever. Again, I paid full price for this. I'm just a really big fan of Coles Boutique and what they do, and I encourage you to check them out. Wrapping up my guitar collection, I have the Taylor 516 CE. Apparently, it's not a very common model. I really like the way that it sounds. It records really well. It's really comfortable overall, and yeah, really good guitar. So as I mentioned before, I work mostly in the box these days because current projects require recallability and also they don't give me the leisure to explore different synths and different sound as much as I would like them to. However, I still can't bring myself to sell my analog gear, even though some of it I haven't used in months, just because I don't think you should sell a gear because you haven't used it. You should only sell gear because it doesn't fit your music personality anymore or you just really want to trade it for something else, better or different that fit you better. But if you like a piece of gear and you want it to fit into your musical personality and into your workflow, keep it. If you don't use it for a few months, then try to use it as much as you can. And so most of my analog synths I haven't touched for a few months now, but regardless, I'm gonna give you a tour of my analog synths. So directly behind me, I have the Moog Sub 37. I love this thing on basses, obviously, but then also on leads and arps. It's paraphonic, so that means you get kind of two note polyphony, but you're playing each oscillator individually. So because of that, you get this weird awesome effect, which is really unique and I haven't heard anything like it. Sometimes I would actually turn around and play it physically with my back to the monitors because it's directly behind me, or if I want to hear it as clear as possible, I would open up the editor and then play it like a VST on my keyboard, but then I could hear it better because I'm facing the monitors, but you can also do automations through your DAW and it's really great. It's kind of like a modern classic. I really love it. On this side of the wall, I have the Korg Prologue. It's a really cool sounding synth. It's both analog and digital at the same time, so you can have a classic sounding synth, but kind of better and more polished, or you can have a bare Juno style type sound and then introduce the hybrid effects or the hybrid oscillators and create this hybrid type of sound. I will come clean and say that I bought the synth because partially I liked the way that it sounded, but mostly because I was really excited when Korg said that users will be able to create their own digital oscillators and digital effect for the synth. But then apparently 
you need to know how to code oscillators and effects in order to make them. And I don't know how to do that. And I'm assuming most users also don't know how to do that. So that resulted in a really finite group of people that sell oscillators and effects for the synth, but it's not a big community of people sharing awesome oscillators and awesome effects. And that kind of got me a little less excited about the synth afterwards, and this is why I don't use it that much. But I guess if MKBHD taught us anything is that you should buy technology based on what it can do right now and not based on the promise of what it might be able to do. But regardless, it's really good sounding synth. I just wish I was able to do a little more with it, I guess. Above the prologue, I have a shelf of weird analog outboard gear. So starting from the left, I have the Auto Bisquit. If you're not familiar with the Bisquit, it is an analog 8-bit reducer with a few cool trick up its sleeve. Ever since I saw the introduction video for the Auto Bisquit, I knew that I wanted one, but that was before I made adult money. So actually buying one was out of the question. And then years later, I saw used one online and I immediately jumped on the opportunity. It has really cool digital effects in it, like pitch shifter and delay. And you can also put it in synth mode and play it like a synth, but it's an analog synth because it uses the 8-bit circuitry, which is super cool. There is a plug-in version available from Softube, but I doubt that it sounds as good as the analog version. It is now discontinued and I feel extremely honored and extremely lucky to have one. Below that, I have the Retro Mechanical Labs Jekyll and Hyde. This is a dual distortion, dual filter effects unit that just destroys everything that you throw at it, but like in the best way possible. It is custom built to order by a guy called Jonathan Irish, and he makes a lot of other awesome distortion and fuzz boxes that I highly recommend you check out. I'll have links to his website in the description below. Next to it, I have the Eventide H9, which is an amazing effect unit, but it is slowly being edged out by the native plugin versions, just because I can open more at the same session and recall them, and I'm not confined just to the one external effect. However, if you are interested in an H9 Max and you're in Canada or on Reverb, be on the lookout, because I'm about to sell this one kind of pretty soon, probably. <laughs> and then finally, in my shelf of weird contraptions, I have the Lyra 8. This is a really, really, really weird analog Russian synth that you play by closing a circuit between the two metal pads for each oscillator. And then you can't play the oscillator like a keyboard, you have to tune each oscillator for each circuit. And then the controls on it are really weird and it makes really weird effects and I used to play it a lot when I was making trailer music, but now not so much. However, I still can't bring myself to sell this one just because it's so out of the box and sometimes you don't know what will come out out of turning some knobs and sometimes you just want to get ideas out or maybe be more creative or really out of the box so yeah um i'm not using it so much but i really like it for some reason and i think with that we're pretty much done with the tour. I think we covered 99% of everything that I have in this room that is actually relevant to a studio tour. Okay, look, this gear took me a lot of time and a lot of hard work to get. And every single piece in the studio is something that I actually use. Even if I don't use it every day or every week or every month, I do use everything that I have in the studio. And I know it's cheesy to say that it's not about the gear, but really it is not. It's not about the gear, but it is about how you use it. If you have really good expensive piece of gear that does not fit your workflow, you're either not gonna use it at all or not take advantage of its full potential. So it's silly to spend so much money on it, right? So try and find things that actually inspire you to create instead of finding that piece of gear that is going to make you a better producer or a better mixing engineer or that plugin that is going to save this production. More often than not, I actually find that having constraints is the best tool for inspiration. Knowing that you can use only one piece of gear forces you to explore its limitations and push the envelope of what is possible. And at the end of the day, isn't that what art is all about? Anyways, I hope that you enjoyed this tour of my studio. I am very excited about the new studio and sharing with you the transition into it and kind of expanding my studio as I go along. Let me know what piece of gear caught your attention the most or if I missed anything and you want me to make a video covering some piece of gear in more details, I would love to do that as well. Let me know what you think in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe because I have more awesome content coming pretty soon. And of course, stay creative, stay awesome. I'll see you in the next one.